What's up guys? Welcome to the Two Wheeled Rider YouTube channel. My name is Mario Orsini. Today we are going to be discussing my cross country motorcycle trip. This is video number three in the debrief series about the trip and today's video is specifically going to be talking about the motorcycle itself and how it did and this motorcycle is my 2016 KTM 1290 Super Adventure. I don't want to keep you waiting, so I'm going to answer the two most popular questions first, and then if you want to hang around and get the rest of the information, feel free to do so. The most popular question I get by far is, how are you riding all of this distance on the stock seat? I'm finally going to share my secret with you tonight. So my secret is a sheepskin. I don't need a three, four, five, six, seven hundred dollars seat. I don't need to make any permanent modifications to my bike. I don't need to send the pan in or anything else. All you need to do is drop about 90 to 100 bucks on a sheepskin. Let me show you how this thing goes on. Now we actually bought this sheepskin as a full pelt and then we cut it down to form fit with our two seats. Now if you only had a single seat, uh, you could probably trim it up really easy. It's a little bit more difficult with, with a two piece seat, but it's not hard. To affix it, all we've done is taken a big piece of elastic. This is what is a two inch piece wide piece of elastic. And if you look here, we just have a safety pin in right there and a safety pin in right there and that is enough to hold it to the seat so i'm going to slip it on and then show you what it looks like so here's what the rider seat looks like with it on now i also use the same piece of sheepskin on my fjr so we weren't able to form it perfectly because it had already been pre-cut but it's pretty close and it covers my seating position you know meaning my butt and my legs on the side so it actually works really well now let me show you what the back seat looks like with it on And there you have it. There's what it looks like on the bike. Now, obviously the Super Adventure seat is gray and not black, but my FJR seat was black and a lot of people couldn't even tell that anything was on there. Let me tell you a couple reasons why we use the sheepskin. Now there's two main reasons we decided to go with, well, maybe three main reasons we decided to go with the sheepskin. First off, for between 90 and $100, you can get an entire pelt. There are multiple colors available, black and tan are, base, are, are your two most basic colors, but there are places that have additional colors. So price was one thing, because if it doesn't work out, you're not out much money and you could always try another solution, even if it were to be an aftermarket seat, you still might want to use a sheepskin with an aftermarket seat, it's up to you. The next reason is it does provide a little more cushion, making it a little more comfortable on your backside. And then the third reason that most, in fact, I don't think, I can't think of an aftermarket seat that provides this solution because you're not sitting directly on vinyl or leather or whatever surface your seat's made out of, you get this fabric bunched under you, which allows airflow through the sheepskin to keep your butt a little bit cooler and a little bit drier on a long ride. I personally love the sheepskin. I would recommend trying it out if you don't have a seat solution that's working for you right now. I personally only know of one place you can get it, well, two places, but I will recommend a place. I'll put it in the description below. It is called Chartlesville Sheepskin out of Pennsylvania, like I said, between 90 and $100, and he'll even throw in the elastic and the safety pins for you. So the second most popular question I've gotten on most of my videos recently, and I've gotten through email and messages on Facebook and everything else, how does Kristen find the comfort of the Super Adventure? And a lot of you are kind of specific in regards to the Yamaha FJR 1300 we used to tour on. So I can't answer that for you. Without further ado, let's welcome Kristen. Hey guys, it's your favorite two world passenger back. Um, so you guys asked a couple questions about some seat comfort and how my positioning was um, as a you know passenger on the back of the bike and a couple of things. Um, the seat compared to the FJR, which was the previous bike we rode on, really not that much different. Uh, I felt both comfortable. This seat with the sheepskin, um, the plus about this is that the heated seat does come through and it stays a little warmer longer, which I like a lot. Um, the backrest, that's another thing that I really need on a long distance trip. With this one compared to the FJR, this one sits a little higher, so it's slightly uncomfortable the longer miles we ride. Uh, I do have to have um, some postural endurance, um, which working out regularly really helps us with that. Um, we lift, so on a long ride, that really comes in handy. Um, the only other thing is around the 400 mile mark, I get a little what I call shifty. Uh, I get kind of antsy, I wanna stand up, I wanna stretch. For Mario, he can stand up on his nice uh, foot pegs down there, but I don't have that luxury back there, so I do have to move around a little bit. Maybe in the future we'll try out some foot pegs that are a little bigger. 
The only other thing I have is when riding on the back, I do wear compression shorts underneath my riding gear and a little trick to avoid the hot spots or the saddle sores back there as I did use some diaper cream, uh, which helped tremendously. So I highly suggest that uh, if you're out for a long ride and wanna give it a shot. All right, so now you've heard what Kristen has to say. And for the record, I don't use any sort of monkey butt powder or cream or anything like that. Um, just suck it up, you'll be fine. Anyway, let me talk about some of the modifications we made to this bike uh, that I was hoping to make it a little bit more tour worthy for specifically for this trip, I'll cover a couple other modifications I made long beforehand, uh, just real briefly, but the ones I made right before the trip, I wanna talk about those and how they did. First off, let's talk about the highway pegs. By the way, Brent Garen's YouTube subscriber sent me the black brackets that I haven't put on yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, highway pegs, how do they do? Uh, even though I caught some crap from people for putting them on there, they were very, very comfortable. It allowed me to put my foot up on top of here or put my leg out over top of it, giving me three different positions. And when you've got a couple of days where you're riding 600 or 500 plus miles, it makes a huge difference. So don't worry about taking crap from the ADV guys. If you wanna stretch your legs out, put a set of these on, well, well worth it. Now the only downside of these pegs, you guys may remember these had little black caps over them. You see the one down here, the one here's missing. I must've hit it with my boot along the way. It's gone and so is the one on the other side, but ultimately, really didn't make any difference. Next up, let's talk about the tank bag. While it was a nightmare to install, the bag did really, really well. I talked about it a little bit in the uh, packing video, but it was excellent. We were able to fit three or four Starbucks mugs in here at a time, plus some of my other stuff. So my only nitpick on it is this pull thing, this pull tab down here. I did have trouble getting off a few times. It started to stick a little on me. After we got home, it seems to be working fine again, so it's just something to be aware of. Now, another modification I did that I'm very happy was the canister removal kit. There was that canister in here. If you didn't see that video, I'll link it right up here of how to get that out of there. Being able to put these few extra little tools and the tool kit and my documents and stuff back here really freed up a lot of space in the top case, allowing us to really fully utilize this space and not waste any. So, you know, for 20 some $30, whatever it was to remove this canister, uh, if you're gonna be doing a lot of touring, I recommend it. Many of you probably saw the Cyclops LED headlight install. If you didn't, I'm gonna link it up here in the corner. Um, we didn't ride at night much, but I'm still very, very happy. These things performed extremely well, and I would definitely do it again. Okay, so you guys heard Kristen mention my giant IMS foot pegs earlier. While not a must do, I do find them to be very comfortable for when I wanna stand up, stretch my legs out a little bit. We are looking to do some modifications to her pegs back here to make them a little bit wider. We're looking into some possibilities. Look for an upcoming video on that soon. A couple of you noticed that I'm still running a cramp buster over here on the throttle tube, despite the fact that I have cruise control and we're asking why. The reason for that is if you're riding twisty roads or whatever, it doesn't really make sense to turn on the cruise control for you know a couple hundred feet. So it's nice to have this on here just to loosen your hand up a little bit, get a good stretch and then get back on that throttle. And for like $10, can't be beat. While not really a modification, I do love my side slash center stand plate that was custom made for me. You can use it under the center stand, you can use it under the side stand, it doesn't really matter. Works for both. Great thing about that is, I mentioned in a previous video, it'll keep you from sinking into asphalt. It'll also keep you from sinking into dirt, mud, and other areas. So you can also just use a plastic puck or a, or a crushed up aluminum can, but if you can get your buddy to make you one of these, get one of these, because this thing's cool. All right, so now that we've talked about some of the upgrades, modifications I made to the motorcycle, let's talk about mechanics of the motorcycle. And I wanna start with kind of my daily routine for the bike. At the end of each ride, I would always go around, visually inspect the tires to ensure there were no punctures, uh, no abnormal wear, anything like that. This thing does have a tire pressure monitoring system on it, so I would take a look at that before we pulled in at the end of the day. I did bring a spare uh, tire pressure gauge just in case, in case something looked low the next morning, I could check it before we took off. I would also give a, an actual measuring, not just a visual inspection, but I would actually measure the chain slack about every 1,500 miles. So about every three days, maybe a little bit less than that on some other days, probably went as long as five. Um, but I wanted to make sure it was with intention. A little bit more on that later. I would also take time to not just inspect, but also clean off all the lights. That goes for the side marker lights, headlight, tail light, and I would also clean off the windshield and keep my mirrors clean on it. But while I was doing that, I inspected all the lights, make sure they were working. And I would also just give the bike an overall visual inspection. You know, when you come out each morning, make sure there's no fluid leaking out of the bike, especially oil, because that could be bad. And just, you know, no leaks anywhere, nothing punctured, nothing torn, that sort of thing. 
you should be doing that at the end of each day's ride. All right, so let's talk just a little bit more about the bike. And I mentioned this, I think in the first video, fuel consumption, we averaged 41 miles to the gallon on this trip. That was two up, that was a loaded down bike. And that was on, and again, I'll touch on this in a minute, mostly high octane fuel. Now I was a little concerned going through Death Valley that you know I didn't want this bike to overheat. Uh, but even though it was 121.6 degrees outside, the bike only got up to 207 degrees. It actually got a little bit warmer when we went through Las Vegas that later that night in bumper to bumper traffic. I think it was like 107 outside and the bike got up to about 212, 213, but that's all the hotter it got on this trip. Most of the time it stayed somewhere in between about 178 and you know 195 degrees. All right, so another popular question was, how did the tires do? Did you have to change the tires out? Well, you know, most of you know that I put brand new Bridgestone Continental Trail Attack 2 tires on probably about 75 miles before we left. So I'm gonna show you the tread depth on the front tire and how it wore and the tread depth on the back tire and how it wore. So here is a look at the front tire. We've got some pretty good depth left there in the middle. They're not really squared off or anything. They're still pretty round. They've actually worn extremely well. And keep in mind, we've got about 7,400 miles on these tires, two up um, with a loaded down bike. So I'm really impressed with how the front wore. Now if we come back here and look at the rear tire, we can tell we've worn it down a little bit more. Still didn't really square it off. We obviously wore down the tread more in the center, but it's wearing pretty well. And again, 7,400 miles, I think this is easily an 8,000 mile tire. If you were riding solo, I think you could probably push it to nine, maybe 9,200 miles. So really impressed with these Continental tires. All right, so let me talk about maintenance I had to do on the bike. Now, something I left out earlier in the day things, check the coolant, check the oil, those sorts of things, or at least check them the next morning. But I did mention chain, and I did have to perform some chain maintenance on this bike uh, day in and day out. I had to lube the chain every day, especially if it rained or something, which it didn't do much of. But still, we're riding three to 600 miles a day. You should lube it at the end of each day. The other thing I had to do is in Montana, I did have to adjust the chain. That was about 23, 2400 miles in. It was about two millimeters out of spec. I adjusted it back to the, the tightest spec. And when we got home, it had only moved one millimeter, not out, but just one millimeter for the rest of the trip. So it did really well. For those of you wondering how I did that, let me show you. While the idea was to use this socket I brought along and stop by Advance or AutoZone or something and borrow a torque wrench, Unfortunately, there wasn't one nearby in Montana, so I went to the factory toolkit. In there, you're gonna find the wrenches you need to adjust the, the, uh, the chain slack, but you're also going to find a wrench to fit your rear axle nut. As you can see, it fits right on top of there, and this extension handle slides on giving you more than enough leverage to bust this thing free, because keep in mind, it should be torqued to 66 foot-pounds of torque, you can easily do this by yourself by using this extension piece. So while the bike was great, it wasn't perfect. I did run into a few issues along the way. The first one was it runs off 91 octane or above, and that wasn't available everywhere we went. There was one place I could only get 87 octane fuel, but it was ethanol free, so that was a bonus, bike ran fine. The second place I could only get 89 octane, it did have 10% ethanol in it. Again, bike still ran fine. But there are some places, even in the United States, where it's difficult to find 91 octane fuel or 93 or whatever you want to run in it, but above 91. Issue number two, speaking of fuel and speaking of ethanol, my fuel gauge, which has been replaced once under warranty, stuck on me twice during this trip. Now, you should use the trip odometer anyway, and I was using both trip odometers, one for the overall trip and one for each uh, fill up. So I knew basically how far I could go anyway, despite the fact that the fuel gauge had stuck on it. Look for an upcoming video about how to fix this. It is a very simple fix, uh, and it's actually an Italian part that's causing this because I saw it last time we took it out. But just a minor annoyance, not, not a deal breaker. Speaking of the trip odometer, the third issue is not really a big issue, but an annoyance. See, I had set the trip odometer, again, one for the trip itself, so I could track all the mileage and the average fuel mileage and all that sort of thing. And then I was setting another one at every fill up. Something I found out about this bike though, is that the trip odometer will only go up to 100 hours with the engine being on with you moving. So we rode far more than 100 hours, not far more, but it cut off with a couple of days left to go during this trip, meaning it automatically reset back to zero miles on the trip odometer. Fortunately, I'd written down the mileage the day before, so I still had my records and everything, 
but I didn't know it would do that. So for those of you guys with Super Adventures or KTM Adventure Bikes, just keep that in mind. If you're going on a multiple week trip, be sure to reset your trip odometer before you get to the 100 hour mark or it's gonna reset it for you. I suppose if I was gonna pick out one more minor annoyance, it's adjusting the windshield. Because at speed, there is a lot of pressure against the windshield, it makes it damn near impossible to adjust on the fly. So you either need to do it at a stoplight or maybe I'm gonna say below 40 miles an hour, just something to be aware of. I didn't adjust it a lot, but it was kind of an annoyance if I wanted a little more wind protection or a little less, and this thing would kind of get locked into place because of all the pressure against the windshield. All right, guys, so let me leave you with some of my final thoughts about how my Super Adventure did on this trip. First off, it did extremely well. I far preferred riding on this bike than I did my Yamaha FJR, even though it's still a great touring bike. I found this bike to be more comfortable, uh, especially for, for longer hauls. It was uh, it just had a little more leg room, you know, sitting up a little more upright, a little bit wetter wind protection, everything's just a little bit better, not, not a ton better when it comes to comfort. Speaking of comfort, I did enjoy the heated grips and the heated seat, especially when you wake up in Montana and it's only 40 degrees. Didn't have to use those creature comforts a lot, but when I did, man, uh, you know, I don't know that we would have been able to cover those miles that early in the morning had it not been for those heated features. Now I know I could get heated gear, but the fact that it's built into the bike is definitely a bonus. Speaking of creature comforts, I did an iron butt without cruise control. So I'm one of those people that doesn't think cruise control is necessary for a touring bike. However, now that I've had it for about a year, I do really like cruise control. The cruise control worked great on this bike. I really only used it, you know, throughout the Midwest and a, and a few of those stretches where you're on some interstate or on some really, really straight road. Uh, it was also great to kick on for maybe a couple miles just to get that right hand stretch back out and then kick it back off and manually back on the throttle. I was also really impressed with the cargo space. The trunk's a little bit bigger on it than it was on my FJR. The left side saddle bag is bigger, even though the right side's exactly the same size. And I did like the tank bag that we put on. We were able to, we didn't purposely take more stuff, but we were able to bring more stuff back with us than we normally are because we had that added space. Now, despite the fact that I had Kristen on the back and we had the bike loaded down, the bike was still very nimble handled very well at low speeds. You couldn't even tell you had the weight on there at higher speeds, uh, still braked well, still gobs of horsepower. And that was something I really, really liked about it. And something I like about it over the FJR is that it is so much lighter. It's not just a perception thing. It actually is about hundred pounds lighter and it was easier to move around parking lots and stuff like that. And then, like I said, things still handled like a dream with Kristen on the back of it and all the rest of our crap. Now, speaking of having Kristen on the back and all of our crap, it was nice to have the electronically adjustable suspension because with a couple pushes of a button, now all of a sudden I can adjust the suspension for that. But on top of that, we did hit some unpaved areas out in Montana. And I wanna say through either Utah or Colorado where we had to ride on dirt. So being able to kick the suspension over into off-road mode and soften it up to take those bumps as we're going off-road. And then also having the different fuel maps to kick over to and kick that over into off-road mode or in the case where it's raining, cut the horsepower back a little bit and turn the traction control up to make it a little bit safer to ride. Really, really nice features to have, especially on a big trip like this where you don't know what kind of conditions you're gonna be going into. So I hope I answered all of your questions about how the Super Adventure did on our big cross country trip. If there's something I left out, let me know. You know, I, I tried to answer everything that popped up, but I may have missed something. So anyway, in closing, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider hitting that subscribe button. Once again, if I missed something or you've got an additional question about the bike, be sure to ask me in the comments section below. I'll try to answer every one of them. And as always, I'll talk to you again soon.